All right, so getting back to some of the topics I've been discussing. Let's start off first with the debate me bros versus the philosophical atheists. Now I've said, and there's no other way that this will end, except in favor of the philosophical atheists. At the end of the day, those will be the only ones left standing. Now the outward manifestation, if you have been paying attention in atheist land, and let me tell you, I have been paying attention. There are two trends going on right now. I'm just talking, you know, in the last couple of weeks that are really relevant to atheist land. One is the, the, the debate over the use of the term heathen. Um, I, I can give you the basics of it, but I'm not going to bother why, because I, 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 I just paid enough attention to understand what the, what the controversy was, but it's not really relevant to me. Um, if you want to get up to speed on that, if you don't know, there's some discussion about the use of the term heathen. You want to get up to speed on that, you can go look a couple of weeks ago on Ocean's Timeline. Look at X Cult Baby's video, and then Matt Dillahunty has a video of it. And those are some of the key players that think GE's wife, Caitlin, is involved. There's a discussion over the use of the term heathen and whether it's appropriate to be used to be called atheism. That's relatively important if you're an atheist. If you're an atheist, you should be aware of that conversation and you should go, go watch these videos. Why? Because that's going on in your community and that's going to be a relatively important thing for atheists in the, in the years ahead. But it's not relevant to atheist Christians at all. I, I personally think that there are a lot of atheists who are going to become sort of polytheists or neo atheo pagans or something like that. I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of atheists trending in that direction. It's just my own personal opinion. Uh, I have a whole bunch of reasons why I think that that I'll go into maybe in a video in the future. But that's not relevant. That's something going on in the atheist community. You can go get yourself up to speed by watching. Oh, there's a Matt Dillahunty video about it, an ex Cold Baby video about it, and a week ago or two weeks ago on Ocean's Timeline there was a discussion about it and I think Caitlin, Chloe, Caitlin or Chloe or G's wife, I, I'm not exactly sure how she, uh, she was involved. That'll get you up to speed. The more relevant one, which you've probably seen if you've been paying any attention at all, is the argument over the term lack deus. Now, social dynamics 101. Listen up because this is very important if you want to understand human beings. The, when, you, when you are trying to figure out a situation or a group or a clique or understand people and how they operate, it's really easy to do. And once you understand how a certain group is wired up, you understand them from now until the end of time. Why? Because they don't really change all that much. They're just minor variations on the same theme. So if you want to get a read on, let's say, metalheads, let's say you were a sociologist and you wanted to, to, to understand metalheads, you go hang out with them. That's the first thing you do is go interact with the metalheads and ask them what bands they listen to and why, and then you go hang out with them and you get a read on them. Once you understood what was wiring up metalheads, you would understand it intuitively, automatically, and then you could hang out with metalheads anywhere all over the world. Why? Because once you understand the pattern, you understand everything about that particular type of subspecies of human being. It doesn't mean you, you know them backwards and forwards, but you, can, you, you get it. You start to understand what's making them tick. Why are they like metal and what they're attracted to and why. You understand their motivations intuitively. That's why I say, this, this came automatically when I was in high school. Why? Because I, I hung out with like every different clique. First of all, my town wasn't very clicky. Second of all, I interacted freely with almost every clique under the sun. You know, I would just show up and hang out with... I didn't even really bother checking off the oven when I go walk up into a group of 100 people on a, ble on a bleachers... I didn't even bother checking who was there. Why? Because I knew I knew somebody and I could hang out with whomever. It didn't really matter to me. Right? I could do the same thing here almost on Twitter and YouTube. The only thing that's been throwing me is that there were no atheists were around when I was in college or growing up. Otherwise, I'd have a much better read on the atheist community than probably most of the atheists themselves. I promise. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times someone has said to me in real life, you know me better than I know myself. And I've been like, uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> well, that's pretty true. Now, the, so, the Social Dynamics 101. The, the, manifest, the, the surface argument is over use of the term lack theism. That is a power struggle. Power struggle are, are almost never about what they seem to be about. Yes, there's an actual discussion over the use of the term, but that could be resolved pretty easily if both sides could agree to certain guidelines. So that's not the real source of, the, of the, what's going on. 
And it's really important to atheism how that gets resolved. And it's only one way it's going to get resolved, in favor of the philosophical atheist. Why? Because the important fissures are actually, that is a surface manifestation of something that is going on, importantly, beneath the surface, and it's been bubbling up for a long time. That's just a surface manifestation. You know, I could, I could give you my own two cents on the term itself. Yes, I understand there's a colloquial definition. The question really is, does the clo colloquial definition correspond with your true position? If it doesn't, you shouldn't use it. If it does, fair enough. Everybody seems to understand that there's a clo colloquial definition, right? Okay, so something else is going on, and that something else going on is a power struggle. Do you understand now? If I didn't say that clearly enough, you know... Try and really think about what I just said. Everybody on both sides seems to understand that there is a colloquial definition, which means it could be resolved really easily, couldn't it? Yeah. Which means there's something else going on, and that something else going on is, in fact, a power struggle. And that power struggle will end clearly and decisively in favor of the philosophical atheists. Why? Because that's what time it, that's what time it almost is, and they are who is to come. They're almost here in force enough and they are, to, they are the ones who are going to be the only ones left standing in the months and the years to come. Why? Here's the really interesting, important reason why. As I said, there's a whole group of people who I call the debate me bro clowns. That's the real source of the tension. Why? Because those guys are a pack of idiots to a man. Those guys are dumb. What is going to do them in more than anything else is what I call the... There are a couple of them who are actually smart. But the ones who are actually smart don't want to use nuanced thought, who are capable of it, don't want to use it. Other than that, they all need to either grow up or go home. That's going to be the only option on the table. It's, it's just going to be straightforward. Grow up and or go home. Grow up, meaning you guys are dogmatic tribal loyalists. Listen to the philosophical atheists. Why? Because they're better men or better behave and much smarter. Listen to your, be listen to your superiors. Why? Because they're better mannered, better behaved, and much smarter. They want to have an actual, real conversation about, you know, propositions. God exists or God does not exist. They're not there to try and score points as tribal loyalists. Why? They don't really care about that. Hence, that's why I said, grow up. The debate me bros are here, for the most part, because they watched that Christopher Hitchens wreck somebody in a debate, or they watched Matt Dillahunty wreck somebody in a debate, and that's why they're here. To wreck somebody. Oh man, I can't wait to square off get you intellectually. I'm going to humiliate you. The problem is, as I pointed out, for the most part, they are two men really dumb. <laughs> I swear to God, that's true. And more importantly, how they're going to be done in is the paradigmatic example I've used of like the content creator top shelf atheist, let's say Paul Gia. If you took a straw poll of other content creators like your vice rhinos and guys like that, he would probably come out as their fearless leader. Maybe, maybe he would probably come out as the one they most respected, my guess, or Drew, perhaps genetically modified skeptic, but my guess is him. So I'll just use him as the paradigmatic example of the top shelf atheist content creator. Okay. He's paradigmatic in the sense also that he came from fundamentalist land. That's really important part of this story. And a huge chunk of the growth market in atheism proper was from fundamentalist Christianity. Going forward, I don't think that growth market is really going to be there. But more importantly, the other part of the growth market was a lot of people saw Matt Dillahunty and or Christopher Hitchens wreck somebody and said, I can't wait to show up and show how smart I am. Those guys are gone. Those guys are gone. They are not going to be able to compete in the months and years ahead, I promise. And here, let me demonstrate why. What is going to do them in more than anything else is the well-placed organic pejorative. The well-placed organic pejorative works like this. If you insult somebody directly to their face, you know, maybe that, maybe they get the message, maybe they don't. As I said, okay, when I was talking about an example, a lot of these guys are the science, science, science crew, right? And they don't know jack diddly squat about science. So when I was talking about quantum mechanics and as it relates to materialism, I got some, like... I'll leave his name out of it. Why? Because, you know, no hard feelings. No hard feelings, dude. You just get a clue. <laughs> I'll leave his name out of it. But I got some intellectual posers squaring off with me right away. Why? Because, of course, the Christian doesn't know anything about science. Can't wait to show him what time it is. <laughs> I swear to God. So he rolls up on me with insults. 
which is clue number one that the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But anyways, he rolls up, I can't imagine what someone like you thinks they know about materialism. Ha 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 ha. But it hardly relates to quantum mechanics. Oh, scoff, scoff, scoff. Okay, the problem is, I knew from the second he wrote that tweet that he had no idea what he was talking about as it pertains to quantum mechanics. He might have taken it to college, he may even be some sort of scientist in real life. But he does not understand quantum mechanics conceptually at all. Why? Because that's a pure, ignorant, stupid tweet. And if he doesn't know why it's a stupid tweet, he has no idea what he's talking about. In real life, I would have smelled that guy out a mile away as an intellectual poser. And it would have gone no further than this. He would have came up on me to try and be condescending. I would have looked him in the eyes. That would have probably been the beginning and the end of the conversation. Why? The second I looked him in the eyes, he knew and I knew that I called his bluff. Uh-huh. I might have had to say that. That's it. That would have been the conversation. I've ostensibly squared off against intellectual poses in real life. I just, there was, no, there was no debate to be had. Why? Because it usually ended right then and there. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're going to school me on, on quantum mechanics. Okay, this should be good. And then my friends would probably start lining up behind me to see what, what was about to transpire. The guy would know without, he'd sense it immediately. He'd feel stupid and walk away. He'd sense immediately, wait a minute, I'm outgunned, I actually don't know what I'm talking about, I better be quiet and walk away before I embarrass myself. That's, what my, that's, what, that's all that would have been communicated. With my skeptical look, look him, deadlock him in the eyes, skeptically, uh-huh, this should be good. And that tone, that would have communicated enough to make him feel stupid and slink off into, you know, poser land. <laughs> slink back off into, I think I'm smart land. Now, that skill doesn't translate well to Twitter. I'm getting okay at it but it doesn't translate well into Twitter. But, irrelevant. That guy, the, the, the person doesn't know Jack Diddley Squat about quantum mechanics. That's the relevant part. Okay? Jack Diddley Squat. He doesn't understand quantum mechanics conceptually at all. He may have taken it in college. Fine. But he doesn't understand the concepts behind it. Why? Because materialism as it pertains to quantum mechanics is really obvious. And it's the first thing you will see all I did to, to, to show to, as, with him is I pointed to a, um, a link that I've been posting a lot of Carlo Rovelli about relational quantum mechanics. I think it's right there in the title. Anti-realism. Okay, anti-realism as it pertains to quantum mechanics is simply the real material world, quote-unquote, as I've been saying a lot, isn't quite actually there. It's what it means as it pertains to quantum mechanics. There's nothing to discuss. He didn't seem to know that materialism was relevant to quantum mechanics at all. He'd probably cry foul at that, but that's exactly what that tweet indicated. And then later on, he started playing dopey atheist games with me. Oh, no, sounds like an argument from authority. Okay, the only thing you've ever learned about, about physics in your entire life has come from an authority. That includes the class you took, that was authority, the textbooks he's demanding that I need to go read before I, before I embarrass myself further. I swear to God, the guy was so condescending, it was absurd. So condescending and ridiculous that it was like, it was like, you know, you're not dealing with the mature adult at the very least. <laughs> Even if he did know what he was talking about, I wouldn't stick around to like inter interact with him. Why? Because that's a totally complete and utter waste of time. But more importantly, as it pertains to the discussion, philosophical atheist versus debate me bros. That was a bit higher up the food chain version of a debate me bro, but it was still a debate me bro. Call their bluff and they're done. He's about as smart a one as you will find. He does kind of understand quantum mechanics, and you've seen him in, tweet, in discussions with other people, and he does kind of understand some of the relevant topics. He could tell you the difference between methodological naturalism. He could tell you that, that stuff is a philosophy. He just doesn't seem to understand it when it comes out of my mouth. Why? Because I'm the dumb Christian. How can I possibly know anything? I think that's the equation inside of him. He kind of understands the topic well enough that he could have signed off on everything I was saying if he hadn't have rolled up with, you know, brimming with condescension. How could this, how could this, this Christian think he even possibly knows anything about science? That's a lot of the equation of the debate me bros. They think Christian equals stupid, Christian equals they don't understand science, can't wait to show them what I know. And then when they come up against cold hard reality, what, they don't know enough to get up to speed, they're gone. They're gone. Why? Because they can't compete. They don't know the topics well enough to get up to speed. They're gone. Why? Because they can't compete. Now, in real life, I could make that guy feel stupid just like that. Poof. Can't do it on Twitter. But, more importantly, how they're also going to go away. 
is the well-placed pejorative. The well-placed pejorative is going to bubble up organically from inside the community, and it's going to decimate it from the outside in. Remember who I use as my paradigmatic example of the top shelf content creator, Paula Gia. Okay, it's going to work like this. I've already, I've already thrown a couple of my own out there. I think my own are pretty good. <laughs> Feel free to use my well-placed ironic put-downs. You know, the Debate Me Bro Clowns I think is a pretty good one. You could also call them the Fallacy This, Fallacy That crew. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good one. Why? Because they go, fallacy. That's a no true horseman fallacy. Wait, no, it isn't. It's a no true scuffs. It's a no, it's a no four horseman fallacy. Oh, yeah, I forgot. That's a no four horseman fallacy. They use misused fallacies. They basically use fallacies at random to mean, I don't know, something sort of close to what it might actually mean, but they misuse fallacies all the time. So you can call them the fallacy this, fallacy that crew. That's a pretty good pejorative. That, that should have some, some impact. <laughs> um... I, I, they do. One guy even said to me, I said, it's the more common position. He goes, sounds like our argument on populum. What, the, what on earth do you think more common means? <laughs> it's not a fallacy. It's what the thing means. It's like the argument from authority. Where, what, where, who on earth is talking about physics in any way, shape, or form that wasn't ultimately derived from a source that is an authority? You either got your information from a textbook or a class, I hope, right? Okay, those are authorities. <laughs> Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, because you're misusing dopey, fallacy this, fallacy that. <laughs> fallacy this, fallacy that. You, don't, you weren't thinking about how it doesn't apply. And the more important part is the guy's kind of really immature. Why? Because he keeps trying to put me down every five minutes. You know, glad I could straighten that up for you. Oh, yeah, you really schooled me, pal. I'm so, I'm so glad that you're so intelligent. Poor little me. <laughs> I swear to God, he's like doubling down on the condescension. <laughs> When somebody doubles down on the condescension, reality check, that usually means they're losing the debate. Why? Because if you're winning the debate, why do you have to be condescending? You don't. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He understands quantum mechanics a little, but he doesn't understand it conceptually at all. And if I were so inclined, I could teach him within five or ten minutes what he needs to know. But he doesn't need to learn anything from me. Why? Because he's Mr. Know-it-all. He's the smartest guy in town. But he doesn't understand the concepts of quantum mechanics. Period. And you're going to find with a lot of the science, 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 science this, science that crew, that's another good pejorative, the science this, science that crew, they don't objectively squat about science. They don't object diddly squat about science at all. Physics is, checks notes, a science. And they don't know squat about physics. Squat. They don't know a little bit of a little. That guy knows a little, but he doesn't understand conceptually quantum mechanics which is fine I'm not I'm not faulting somebody for being ignorant I'm not an intellectual snob at all if you're ignorant and you don't know quantum mechanics I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you if you don't know quantum mechanics and you roll up on someone to try and demonstrate how much you know you're a freaking poser you should be embarrassed to be doing that <laughs> first of all behaviorally you should be embarrassed but you know if you actually don't know the topic at hand that's pathetic. So anyways, how it works. The well-placed pejorative gets bubbles up organically. I just gave you three that aren't quite good enough but could actually be successful in and of themselves. The fallacy this, fallacy, this, fallacy that crew, the debate me bro clowns, the science, 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 don't know jack squat about science guys. <laughs> that's a pretty good one. I think, I think that's pretty good. Why? Because that sums them up pretty well. The point of the well-placed pejorative is it accurately describes the behavior of a certain segment of the population well enough that it's read their mail, took their notes, got their number, and it's called them out. So now, when our, when our paradigmatic example of a content creator, top shelf atheist, a.k.a. Paul Gia, goes to make his video, he doesn't want to feel stupid. He's got enough integrity, enough intelligence to know that some of the stuff I'm talking about in terms of social dynamics is the God's honest truth. Any idiot listening to these videos can tell you some of this is the God's honest truth. You don't agree with all of it? Fine. You know, I might not be that accurate. I might be getting some things wrong. But anybody with enough intelligence and enough integrity can tell you that I'm painting a really, really good picture of an important part of the atheist community and painting it really well. So when he goes to make his video, you know, that pejorative is going to be ringing in his ears. <laughs> he goes to make his video, and he's going to, that pejorative is going to be with him. 
and it's going to make him course correct just enough that those guys are going to be held accountable. First of all, it's a small community, guys. Every name, every name I name, almost all of you know, have interacted with, have watched videos of, have seen their tweets. There are very few names I'm throwing out here that none of you have heard of. When I, when I go higher up the food chain, say Bernardo Castro or John Bravecki, a lot of people don't know who I'm referencing, who I'm talking about. Okay, but when I say Paul G, everybody knows who I'm talking about. And Shannon Q, everybody knows who I'm talking about. I already said I think Shannon Q is going to be the first one to go philosophical atheist. That could end all of it right then and there. Why do I think that she's going to be the first one? Because she is the smartest. She's the smartest pants of, of the, she's the smartest pants. She's the smarty boots. <laughs> That's what I call my wife all the time, smarty boots. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's fun. Take it or leave it. I, I, I find it entertaining, you know, if you don't find my jokes entertaining, you have a heart of stone. But you'll never break, never break, never break this heart of stone. Oh, no, no, no. You'll never break this heart of stone, darling. Craig Reed is so funny. Everyone knows when he makes really funny jokes. Those jokes are really funny. <laughs> I, could, I, I, I boxed myself in. I couldn't figure out how to, how to end it. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> What's different about her? I don't really know. No matter how I try, I just can't make it cry. But you'll never break, never break, never break. This heart of stone, oh no, 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 you'll never break this heart of stone, darling. So, oh uh, yeah, I figured I'd break out some little, little Mick Jagger. Um, I think she will be the first to go fill, full philosophical atheist, as I've said. She's all practically already there. Some of the discussion that you're seeing take place amongst the smarter of those crew, John Steingrad in particular, Shannon, uh, John Steingrad strikes me as pretty much smart. He's already starting to poke around in things that will lead him in different directions. Panpsychism, he's asking about. Now, you don't have to sign off on panpsychism. Just to clarify for those of you who are confused about how this relates to philosophy of mind and the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, idealism is a philosophy. Panpsychism is a theory of consciousness. They can both be true at the exact same time. Materialism is over. If you do not understand that, think about the hard problem of consciousness and how it represents a really strong challenge to materialism. If you don't understand that it does, you don't really understand the hard problem of consciousness. But the reason why I went higher up the food chain and started dealing with quantum mechanics, why? Because quantum mechanics effectively decimates, decimates materialism need not have done so. The only reason why I've done so is because precision is required at those high levels. Those are abstract calculations and they are very precise. The Schrodinger equation works. Everybody understands that. It's what's powering your cell phones. Okay, materialism didn't need to be defeated. Why? Because once upon a time long ago it was arbitrarily invented. There was an arbitrary Arbitrary keyword, arbitrary keyword, arbitrary. I got it, okay, arbitrary. Shut the, shut the F up about arbitrary. Okay, fine. Do you got it? I got it. Arbitrary. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what I do with my wife all day long. She, she, she knows I do it. I, I like the way something sounds, so I say it over and over again. I just keep saying it. And she's like, stop saying that. You're saying the stupidest things. I do it all day long with my wife. I swear to God, I do it all day long. I just like the sound of a certain phrase, so I keep saying it, I keep saying it over and over again. And then, you know. Anyways, uh, so it's arbitrarily, materialism arbitrarily was invented. Arbitrary separation of mind and matter once upon a time long ago by Descartes and then adapted by the scientific commun community. Mind was always coming back in the picture. End of discussion. Why? Because the, 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 the separation was arbitrary. It was always going to come back in. Always going to come back in. The only thing that quantum mechanics did is that the calculations are so precise that there was no way to avoid the obvious anymore. Why? Because it was right there in the calculation. Prior to measurement, the quote-unquote real material world exists, in quotes, exists, 
as a wave of probabilities. What does that mean? It hasn't actually occurred yet to some degree. That's why it trips everybody out philosophically. Why? Because it isn't actually there. When I say there is no standalone ontology to the real material world, I mean there's no standalone ontology to the real material world. If No, that's not word salad. It's not. No, it's not word salad. It's, not word salad. it's word salad. I told you it's word salad. No, it's not word salad. Not word salad. It's not word salad. If you do not understand what I meant by that, you got to go back over it, rewind, think about it. And then think about this one sentence, and this is the first thing they will teach you in quantum mechanics. I promise you the guys rolling up on me do not understand quantum mechanics at all. They may have taken it and they, may under they don't understand it conceptually. There's a reason why it's been tripping everybody out. And that's because the implications were obvious right from the first. Prior to measurement, the real material world exists as a wave of probabilities. A probability hasn't occurred yet. Now, there's going to be precise understanding of this in the months and years to come. And I think the only route towards investigating this properly is idealism. Now, when I say idealism, I don't mean idealism is true. Go out and it's, this isn't the only people who, who think this way are fundamentalists, Christians, and atheists. You, you bring up a person, you say John Verveke, and a fundamentalist Christian and an atheist will go watch them and find all these objections, like you're saying, I agree with everything that guy says. That's what they'll do. Both of them will do the exact same thing. Well, John Verveke says, that, and they'll come up with thing, weird objections that are totally irrelevant. When I say somebody is interesting and or relevant, like Donald Hoffman, John Verveke, Bernardo Castrop, and most importantly of all, Carlo Rovelli, if you want to go check my physics, go check it with Carlo Rovelli. When I tell you that his relational school of quantum mechanics is going to be the dominant, most influential school interpretation within five years, I mean that. You can write that on your wall and hold me accountable to that. I do not want to debate it on Twitter. Why? Because a really good chance you have no idea what you're talking about. And I don't want to waste my time talking to you. All of you listen to me. Write that on your wall and hold me accountable. Within five years, relational school of quantum mechanics will be the most influential, most respected interpretation in quantum mechanics. Write it on your wall hold me accountable. The only thing that needs to happen is it needs to be tweaked. Somehow the idealism needs to be put back in. Carlo Rovelli deliberately processed it out on purpose. Why? Because he's a scientist after all. So he doesn't want to be anything other than a materialist. But he understands the implications of his postulate because the impl implications are obvious just in the title. Anti-realism. To some degree the real material world doesn't exist. Now the question is how can that be true? The only possible answer isn't a simple yes, no, good, bad, black, white, right. Uh, that's fundamentalist thinking again, binary thinking. It is a really complex question by the best and the brightest in the absolute peak of the intellect in the entire world, Carlo Rovelli. Okay? It's a really, really complicated question. You don't just answer it. That's how atheists think, and that's how fundamentalist Christian, the, the type of atheist I'm talking about think, and that's how, you know, that's not how philosophical atheists think. That's how atheist proper, atheist proper is the the pack of people who call themselves atheists on Twitter and YouTube. They, you say, go go watch John Verveke, and they come they come back with 50 objections. Why? Because they're they're thinking of them only in terms of propositions. When he said this proposition, this was probably false. They, that's all they score things on. It's not the point. If you ever went to college, and some of you, it seems, didn't go to college, they don't teach you a philosophy as like, you know, here's, here's Schopenhauer, here's Nietzsche, this is 100% true, and this is what you need to believe in. That's not what they do. They go, here's Schopenhauer, here's his key ideas, and here's why they were influential. And you're supposed to just think about it. Oh, I didn't know that, Craig. Yeah, I swear to God. That's what they actually do in all the good colleges. They just teach you the philosophy so that you think about it as an interpretive framework or how it influenced people. They don't teach you it as a series of propositions, good, bad, right, wrong, up, down, black. It's not binary. It's not binary. There's only two types of people who think mostly in binary. Fundamentalist Christians and fundy atheists. Other than that, most everybody else is to some degree or another nuanced. There are, uh, you know, when you start getting into politics, you find other people who think binary. Why? Because they think like tribes. 
Democrat, Republican, you know, Republican says it's good, Democrat says the same thing. Well, it was bad when he said it. <laughs> it was bad when he said it. I liked it when, that, I liked it when my guy said it. Now still, they think in tribes. I noticed that a long time ago with my mother. Why? Because she was freaking Mrs. Democrat born and bred through and through. She was tribal law. That's why I never, never deconverted from the Democratic Party, even though I'm, you know, not crazy about what they represent all the time. And I don't think they represent, I don't think they're operating on all five cylinders. And let's just say I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the stuff that's come up of late. But I never, de I never deconstructed, still registered Democrat of respect for my mother. Even though she was no longer with us, I got what are haunting me from beyond the grave. I can't believe you registered. You're still, you're still a Democrat. I, I don't even want to go there. Why? Because she'll haunt me from beyond the grave. I swear to God she will. Why? Because she was thoroughly loyal to the Democratic Party. You know, I respect loyalty to a certain degree. My wife is bone loyal to the Republican Party. I respect it to a certain degree. I, I kind of agree with people who play teams and they play it based on principle, you know, because I grew up with my parents and I, I respected their, you know, I don't know what it was about them that I respected, but there was a certain loyalty to team that you didn't question, you just went team. That's why I have respect for fundamentalist Christians to a certain degree. Why? Because they're playing teams. They're playing teams. They're not necessarily thinking about the topic, okay, yeah, I understand that. They're not thinking about the topics at all, okay, yeah, I understand that. But they're playing teams. The only thing I don't respect is when the atheists play teams too. Why? Because you deconstructed from that team for ostensibly that reason. You notice that they were tribal loyalists. If you become tribal loyalists, that's just too ironic. And it ain't going to last. Why? Because you're going to be held to account by the philosophical atheists who are more like me than you. Who are more like, they're more of my, of my house than, you know, the goofball tribal lows guys. Why? Because first of all, those guys are dumb. Let's just make that perfectly crystal clear. That should, that should, that's the thing that's going to do him in more than anything else. Why? Because when Paul Gia goes to make his video, and remember, he's the paradigmatic example of the influencer in the atheist community. He's going to, he's going to have their stupidity <laughs> ever present in his mind from here on out. And he's going to be thinking to himself, I've got to course correct this a little. Why? Because some of my audience isn't smart enough. Isn't doing this right, and I need to teach them. And I need to be the leader. I'm not saying he'll do it, but I need to be the leader. And someone will take this mantle, though. My bet, my bet is Paul Agia. If he doesn't do it, someone else will take his place. They're not doing well enough. I need to teach them. It's what Drew originally thought his mission was about, teaching atheists how to atheist, using good arguments, using understanding the topics well enough so that they go into a space where the topic is being discussed and they don't embarrass themselves. Drew might still make that his mission, but he's got to get up to speed in two key areas. Hard problem of consciousness, philosophy of mind, and you know, materialism, idealism. Those are the topics that those are the most important topics coming down the pike. Period. That's my guess, okay? You can, that's not, you don't have to write, write that on your wall. <laughs> you know, do I have to write that on my wall? No, you don't have to write that on the wall. It's not going to be on the test. I just happen to think that that's really true. Why? Because that's the most relative, relevant thing coming down the pipe. Most of the other stuff that gets discussed in this space, I don't care about at all. I care about what time it is in atheist land. Why? Because that's really important. And that is being, you know, how that's manifesting itself is ostensibly the debate over the use of a term, but that is actually just a, a man surface manifestation of a deeper fissure. It's a surface, it's a power struggle. It is a surface manifestation of a much deeper fissure. And that much deeper fissure is ending in favor of the philosophical atheist, no ifs, ands, or buts. Why? Because the this, this space isn't that big. Everybody, every name I mention, you know, everybody can be held account. Everything that is going on here takes place in public. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I understand that not that many people will really truly understand that. Everything you do in Twitter is happening in public, which means you can be held accountable to it. And every single debate that goes on, modern day debate or anywhere else, is happening in public, which means you can be held accountable to it. And if you won that debate by anything other than the quality of your arguments and the quality of your argumentation alone, I can revoke that victory five months from now and make you look like an idiot. You can do that? Yes, I have that type of power. Why? Because that power is only accountability. Intellectual integrity demands 
intellectual integrity demands that certain key players in the atheist community start listening to me and correcting now. Why? Because th this, what I'm saying is coming, is coming. And if you aren't ready for it, it's going to bite you on the butt and you're going to look like, you're going to look and feel like the dumb guy. Feel dumb. Feel dumb is the key. I can't make you look bad. I can, no, I can't make you look bad. I don't think. Can I make them? Can I make these people look? No, I can't make anybody look. I can't. I don't have that type of power. Wow, phew. <laughs> we, were, we were starting. For, we were afraid that you were omnipotent, Craig. Getting close. No, I'm not omnipotent, guys. You know, <laughs> no worries at all. Don't worry, your pretty little atheist heads. I am not omnipotent. And if your atheist heads are getting worried, I'm not going to sentence you to hell. You're like, this Christian's going to sentence us to the hell any minute now. <laughs> I'm not going to sentence you to hell for playing with Pokemon. <laughs> I swear to God, I think that's 80% of the baggage right there. 80% of the baggage right there. Why? Because they don't want to believe in a God that hates them. <laughs> Rocket science. Yeah, this is Jesus. We say he loves you, but we preach that he hates you. <laughs> he hates you. He can't wait to send you to hell for playing with Pokemon. <laughs> I can understand how that might be slightly traumatic to a five-year-old. Yeah, a five-year-old playing with Pokemon, and his dad comes in like, "Yo, what are you doing? Don't you know God's gonna send you to hell for that?" I can understand how there may actually be trauma involved. Okay, that's pretty traumatic. Okay, no, I'm not sending anybody listening to me. If you're an atheist, don't worry. I'm not sending you to hell anytime soon. Why? Well, so you can let me win. You can let me win. Why? It's going to be in all your best interests. First of all, the dynamics that I'm talking about are the truth. Listen to the video, play it back slower, and then go out into the community and say, "Does this correspond to reality?" You will say, "Yeah, actually, it really does." <laughs> yeah, it really does. Why? Because it ain't rocket science. It's not. It's a simple little thing that I used to, we used to talk about once upon a time long ago in America that barely exists anymore, but is still sort of there struggling to survive. We used to call that thing the truth. <laughs> we used to call that thing the truth. And we used to have respect for it and honor for it and some degree of reverence for it. Yeah, I agree. But that's a long time ago, Craig. <laughs> One of these fairy tales of this place called America that doesn't exist anymore. I agree. If you live in L.A., that place sort of doesn't necessarily correspond. There's still the ghost of America. America's still here, guys. Still here. And it will be here for at least the next 25 years. After that, who knows? Be here for the next 25 years. That's my prediction. And be here strong and flourishing in the next 20 years to come. Why? Because there will be somewhat of a revival or a rebirth. You know, the, 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 the criticisms are valid to a certain degree. What, hap what needs to happen is the criticisms need to be internalized and handled properly. And, you know... That's how I see it. Uh, I'm starting to ramble. Yeah, but you're starting to ramble. You're starting to just say disjointed things, Craig. Yeah, I understand that. All right, fine. All right, fine. I'll wrap it up. 38 minutes. See, these things just go by like that. Cool. Why? Right, because I enjoy myself while I'm making them. That's the key. I have a good time. The reason why they're, they're so long is because it takes a while for me to get into the rhythm of it. You know, I've got to gather, catch that rhythm. Yo, I've got to catch that rhythm, man. And then I get into the rhythm of it, then I start enjoying it. And then I don't want to stop. That's, you hear me struggling because <laughs> I don't want to put the thing down and stop talking. You can hear the struggle in my voice, can you? That I want to, because once I start having fun, I just want to talk, 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 talk. This is what used to happen to me in social situations. I have to actually dial it down. We're going to be going out this Thursday, going to socialize with people since the first time since the uh, quantum era, since the COVID era. First time out in public. And I have to literally dial it down and force myself to stop talking. Why? Because I can easily dominate a table full of people, seven people at the table. I can easily be the only one talking the entire time. And then it won't get mad at me. My wife can do it too. My wife tells stories that go on forever. Same reason. <laughs> like, get to the point. Because right? she doesn't want to stop talking when she starts. <laughs> she tells her, she gets to the point. She, ever, ah, ah. she, she, she puts in 50,000 She does the same thing. It's called a talker. People who are naturally loquacious and eloquent and like to talk, 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 like when they start getting them revved up to talk, they get in a talking mood and then you can't shut them up. <laughs> I'm one of those type of people. I'm either totally quiet, don't feel like talking at all, isolate in my little man cave and watch Netflix and, you know, watch YouTube videos, the ones that I mention usually, and then, you know, read a book or two. But once I start talking, I don't want to stop. 
That's a talker. I told you who I think is like that. Shannon. Shannon is like, that's why she's struggling. You hear this internal monologue in her, or this internal dialogue where she's talking about writing videos and how right she's not. You're not a writer, Shannon. If you listen to this video, I don't know if you listen to my videos. You're not a writer. Do what I do. Make 10 videos in a row just talking to a microphone. Paul, get her to do this if you're listening. I don't think they're listening. If you're listening, somebody tell Paul, get her to talk into a microphone, make 10 copies, and post one. Then keep practicing. Just talk, 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 talk. Why? She's a talker. She's a talker. That's how I perceive it. Talkers don't write. They talk. Writers write. You know, if you're a writer, same thing, different, same equation. Write, 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 write. And keep writing. Anyways, yeah, I'm rambling. I'm rambling. You're rambling a lot at this point. All right, fine. I'll wrap it up with that. I will, I will finally get myself to, <laughs> to stop talking. Uh, that is all for now. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.